Hello everybody, it is Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. And today we are going to continue on with our basic tutorial for Field of Glory 2. And of course we are doing that in anticipation of Field of Glory 2 Medieval dropping tomorrow, which is February 4th. Uh, really looking forward to that game. It will be expanding out the time period that this game operates in. But of course, the rules will essentially be the same. The whole This game, Field of Glory 2 and Field of Glory 2 Medieval, will be based on the board game rules uh, that these uh, games are ported from. And so by learning our basics here, we will be ready when that game drops tomorrow. I will probably do some sort of live stream with that, either tomorrow or here over the weekend uh, because I want to go look look at the different factions see the different orders of battle uh, it looks very majestic once you have the French cavalry with all of their blue or the British with all of their red flags and whatnot it looks very nice so anyway let's jump back into this I am doing a quick battle out of the rise of Rome we are going to be the ancient British and we will be fighting the Romans. Now I'm going to use this as a teaching tool so we may not always take the optimal move uh, because I want to show you some combat. I want to show you the shooting mechanics uh, and just talk to you about kind of basic tactics in general. So we're going to fight this fight all the way through. Well, I don't know if we're going to fight it all the way to the end, but we are going to show a lot of the different fight mechanics. So let's go ahead and create this. It's a small map, small force size. Uh, this is the invasion of Britain in 54 BC, and we will see the game create here and get to the battlefield. Now, there are a few things that I want to talk about before we actually jump into moving around troops. We have covered a lot in these tutorials, but there are a few things that I just want to you know, mention before we get started. Now, first of all, this is the screen that you will be presented with as you start every new game. That will tell you the two factions that are fighting. We are the ancient British with a table of equipment uh, here of 60 BC, 80 AD. Uh, so this is going to be their order of battle from that time. I say theirs. That's ours. We're the ancient British, the Britai here. So these are neither uh, Anglo-Saxons nor Normans. These are actually the original British, the Britai. Uh, the Romans from 105 to 25 BC, when the legions had really reached their zenith, uh, through various reforms, whether they be the Marius reforms or now Caesar had gotten his, you know, they had learned a bit from Caesar by this time or at least late in this era. Uh, so 105 to 25 BC. Now, what's our objective? We need to route the enemy army by either A, routing at least 40% of their troops and 25% more than we have lost. So our routing, if they get to 40% routing and we're only at 15, we would win that way. Or if we just route 60% of their troops, that's it. That's a victory. That's a winner. Okay, we are going to play 24 turns. Maybe. We'll see what happens. And then you see this custom battle. The enemy are offering an open battle. What does that mean? Well, we talked about this earlier in the tutorial, which is you have all these different kinds of scenarios that you can play. You can guard a baggage train. You can try to win before the enemy gets reinforcements or you know, try to hold them off until you get reinforcements, so on and so forth. We already talked about that. In this one, it's just an open battle. This is is the victory conditions here up at the top. So let's click off that. You may say, well, how will I know that? Right up here is the scoreboard. As we route, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but as we route Roman troops and they their flag turns white and they start to flee the battlefield, we will get a percentage increase here that will be in green and it will show us exactly the percentage of their troops that have routed. Now, meanwhile, down here, the Roman score, that will be in red and that will show how many of our troops the Romans have routed. Now, as we get started in a game, you'll see you always start in the deployment mode. Now, when you are in the deployment mode, generally you can move your troops around Although I must say, in many, many of these battles, they already start as far forward 
as they you know as is possible let's click on this unit you can see the grid board here we could not move any further in deployment mode even if we wanted to we could only move some troops backwards okay now many times you will be able to place a general wherever you want to generally speaking uh, and I didn't mean that as a joke, generally speaking, you're going to have either three or four generals on the field. You are going to have what is called your commander-in-chief, and you see right down here in the tooltip, Kamalakas, son of Nemoa, is what I'm going to call him, is the CNC, that is the commander-in-chief, that is your head general, your the big honcho, the five-star guy, right? If we click on him, you'll see, and I had three already pressed. When I press three, you see his command range, and his command range is quite large. Now, what are these other ornate flags around the map? We see one over here, we see one here, we see one here. These are our sub-generals. Now, those sub-generals can take two different flavors. You can either have kind of what we, I would call a regional commander, kind of an intermediate or medium level. Uh, and let's see if this guy is him. Nope. This is actually what I would call a tactical or a field level general. He can command up to four hexes, uh, basically the diagonals, you know, count as 1.5. So one, two, three, four. But, you know, it's four hexes that this guy can command. Now his flag, I thought it, he would be a more intermediate general because he had a higher flag, but that's because he's on a chariot and that maybe raises his flag a bit higher. Uh, I will not make a joke about that. Um, now we've got this guy here. This is a Barus. What is our Barus? Well, here is your intermediate level general. And let's count the hexes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh my gosh, I'm running out of real estate. Uh, generally, these guys can do up to eight. Up to eight. Let's see if that's true with him. He's here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Sure enough, he can do eight in every direction. I say do, he, that is his command range. That means that troops would be within his command as long as they are within this shaded area here. All right, and then we'll have another one over here. He is just a four, as you can see, one, two, three, four. He is, uh, you know, that tactical level, field level general. So we have two of those on each, you know, one on each flank. We have this guy here that is kind of our, uh, you know, intermediate regional uh, two or three star general. Let's put it this way. These guys are one stars and this guy's a five star. Here's our, you know, two or three star general. Now, we may not want him so close to this guy because ultimately, you know, we want our command range to care to cover as much territory as possible. And so we may want to move him to the middle. So let's click on here. All right. So we've selected his unit. And as we start moving down here, you can see that general icon, right? You see that right below where my cursor is. That allows us to move which unit the general is in. Great. Why don't we move him to this one? And how do I do that? How do I give an order? Well, I'm playing left mouse click only. Uh, if you're playing right mouse click as well, or playing left and right, uh, you could right click and that's how you give orders. For the way I'm playing, the way I've selected it in the settings, I left click and that brings up the possible orders for this unit, the one that I have, uh, you know, that I'm on right here. And we're going to say transfer the general and there he goes, he's right over here. Now, who is he commanding? He is commanding, directly commanding, I should say. Everyone in a shaded box is who he is commanding. Excellent. Now, let's take this guy. He and everybody else here is being commanded by this sub-general, which makes sense. They're all in chariots. This one back here, even. They're all in chariots, so, you know, they have the same command. How could you tell that? Well, you can see the general icons here, and that would be their general. Now, you may say, what difference does command radius make? And you would be asking a wonderful question. Well, if they are directly in battle with their unit, uh, and so they are participating in the battle, <clears throat> they give certain buffs and benefits 
Uh, also, if those troops become disorganized, which we'll get into here in a minute, or fragmented or routed, they can help rally those troops. Uh, so they generally uh, kind of buffet up the troops. You know, they either make them fight better originally, or if they start, if those troops start to uh, fragment or rout or disorder, then they can help rally them from that state. So you do want to have your general kind of up close to the action with your troops. What else do they do? Well, any of these troops that are in command range get a free 45 degree turn if they're maneuverable troops okay and so let's click on these guys and it says right down here unmaneuverable so they never get a free 45 degree turn but let's go out to the cavalry here and the cavalry are light horse they always get a free one light troops always get a free and you may say what what do you mean a 45 degree turn well let's take these guys okay and let's go over here at a 45 degree angle and let's turn them that direction and now as you see they have turned this direction we look at their uh, action points they still have 20 of 20. Uh, now that also is because we're in the deployment phase but let's just say that that's a, a rule if you have light troops and your light troops so let's talk about the general basic kinds of troops you have what are skirmishers i'll call skirmishers you have slingers okay you have javelin men let's see if we can go find some javelin guys nope slingers slingers okay well let's back up we may not have any javelin men, and we do not. And we also do not have any bowmen. But anyone that is firing missiles or rocks or javelins is, is generally speaking, always a light infantry troop. And you'll see here, light foot, okay? Then you have your regular infantry. And that's what these guys are. We'll click on it. And these guys are called warriors. Warriors are considered what is called in this game medium infantry. All right. So there's light infantry, medium infantry. And when we see the Romans, when we have contact with the Romans, you will see what is called heavy infantry. And heavy infantry essentially means they're not as maneuverable they have more armor, they're more protected, uh, they are what, you know, heavy, it's kind of all in the name, right? They are infantry that is more well armored, more uh, kind of, you know, they have more attacking ability, generally speaking. M medium foot is kind of the intermediate level. And then light foot are these guys firing around missiles. Okay, then you have cavalry, all right? And cavalry, I'll also include chariots to some degree. You know, this is horse-drawn vehicles. These are horses. The third categ main category, I would say, is artillery. Now, we do not have any artillery on the field, but you do have things that can fire projectiles. They generally cannot move after the deployment phase. All right? Now, why is all that important? Well, just above and beyond what kind of you know combat that these uh, different units are best at it also they are affected by the terrain differently and one thing we have not talked about really is the terrain so let's talk about that for a minute there are four basic types of terrain that you have to remember and the rules kind of around how they affect troops I think make perfect sense. They're logical. There's something I don't think that you'll easily forget once you know it. And that is, so the first type is open ground. And as you see, the tool tips in this game are very good. They will show you every hex here. As we move on to this hex, it is open ground. Now it is a hill, but it's still open, open, open. Okay. That's the first type of terrain. And it is the base type. Essentially, everything is kind of uh, at zero when you're talking about terrain effects when we're on open ground. It's the base terrain, all right? The second and one level up uh, from that is non-open terrain. Uh, now, non-open terrain, 
I don't know if we necessarily have any here, uh, but it is, uh, this, this says, okay, built up area, rough terrain, not open. What does not open mean? That means that your frontage, if you've ever played a war game before, you may have heard this term frontage. What does it mean? Well, when we look at this unit here, it's got 741 men. Now, I told you before that the maximum that can fight at the front here is 480. And so, you know, if an enemy unit has 480, our first 480 guys are going to fight their first 480 guys. And so it's going to be equal at the start, no matter how many men we have. Now, as we lose men, men will come up from the back ranks. And so we're, you know, our numerical advantage is still the, just that an advantage, but we, we at the start will be not be fighting with more than 480 men. And in what is called the impact round, which is the initial round of combat with other units, we have no numerical advantage for uh, sake of the game. Okay, as an operation of the game, that's called frontage. And all it's really trying to do is simulate the fact that, you know, you can't stick like 20,000 men in this one square, right? They could never all get up to the front. Well, in this case, it's 480 men. That is just the rules of the game. So what does not open mean? Well, if we were fighting here, okay, we, the number is not even 480 it would be a lesser number than that because it's not open. So our frontage might be 200 men. It may be 150, it may be 300, but it will be something less than 480. Otherwise, if all other things being equal, if something is not open for the pluses and the penalties, you know, for the bonuses and the penalties for terrain, it is considered just like open. It's just that your frontage has gone down. Okay, so that's the second type. That's two of four. Number three of four is what is called rough terrain. And here we see rough terrain. It's rough ground, a hill, rough terrain. Now the tooltips will always tell you what kind of terrain something is. So rough terrain here, rough ground here, but it's rough terrain. Okay, what does rough terrain mean? Well, it severely disrupts chariots, and that just makes sense, right? What rough means is that there are rocks about. There are rocks, the, the ground is rough. You know, it just, it's all in the name. It's rough ground. And just logically, you can think, well, chariots probably aren't going to operate too well in rough ground. And that is true. It severely disrupts them. Now, what is disruption? We're going to get into that here in a minute. But essentially, it's what you think it would be. The troops get disrupted. They are not as good of a fighting force. I always think of disruption at, as guys or as units fighting kind of at half strength. They're they're not fighting as well. They uh, you know they can't maneuver as well. They can't uh, help each other out as much. So chariots are severely disrupted, and heavy foot. So remember we talked about. Light foot, medium foot, any heavy foot does is disrupted if it is in rough ground, okay? Now, what's the final type? Well, the final type is difficult ground, all right? In difficult ground, we can find, or difficult terrain, I should say, uh, for instance, is woods. It would also be a, you know, a really, really rough patch. And you'll see them sometimes. It's kind of like mountainous. Uh, but let's just look at these woods here. Uh, woods, difficult terrain. This is also not open, by the way. So the frontage is smaller. It And the tooltip tells you it severely disorders mounted. So we're talking any cavalry there. Elephants and heavy foot. That, those are severely disordered, all right? They essentially are not even uh, cohesive fighting forces at that point. Um, and then it disorders all others. So that includes our medium foot here. It's severe, or it severely disorders mounted elephants and heavy foot, disorders others except for light foot. Okay, so light foot here 
our missile launchers, our slingers, our javelin men, our skirmishers, for lack of a better word, they are never disrupted. It does not matter what terrain they're in. And if you think of why that is, well, I mean, if you're shooting a sling, what difference does it make, you know, what kind of terrain you're standing on? essentially uh they just and they can scatter very easily they're not as big of a units and so they never get disrupted medium foot only gets disrupted in difficult terrain which is the worst kind of terrain in the game uh and then they do not in rough but heavy heavy gets disrupted in rough it gets severely disrupted in in this difficult terrain Okay, uh, and then chariots, you know, screw up. Basically, you've got to be in open ground, which makes sense. And also, mounted troops are always going to be better off if you have them in open ground. And so that's uh, essentially terrain. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about before we start moving troops around and we start talking about combat or showing combat are your banners. Your banners are very important. Now, we all you know, kind of already talked about these with respect to generals, right? So the more ornate ones are where your generals are, and you can very easily identify them because of that. Um, but what about the banners for your regular troops? Well, they actually give you quite a bit of information. They're going to tell you if you start to take losses, they start to get tattered, uh, and you will say, oh gosh, that unit must be in trouble because half the damn flag is gone. They get tattered. If these units get in a state other than ready, they also tell you that. And what does that mean? So I just talked about disordered, right? Essentially, troops can be in one of four states. The first state is ready. And we see all of our troops are in ready state. And you can just very quickly tell that by the flags. The flags are whole, they're complete. There are no warning uh, colors on them or anything. These are all just ornations here. These are uh, just make our flags look cool, I guess. But they're not like showing you, you know, that something's wrong. This means that the troops are ready. They are ready to fight. Uh, they don't have any penalties against them. As they, these troops take losses, as I said, the banner will start to get tattered, okay? Then if they get disordered, and we just talked about disorder, there will be a yellow stripe that is on top of the flag. Now, it's a little unfortunate, I guess, that we have yellow in our flag, but let me tell you, it's very t easy to tell when you have that disordered uh, streak up here because this will turn yellow and you will know it immediately. Now, what what is the third state? So we go from ready to disordered and then the third state is fragmented, all right? And fragmented, I always think of as this unit is really in big trouble. They're essentially not even a cohesive fighting force at that point. It, they're trying to hold, you know, you have a couple of guys trying to hold on and hold off the enemy, but most guys are getting scared. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, we're getting overrun. And so I always think of, of fragmented as, as essentially being zero. You know, you're, they're, they're not running yet. They have not taken off, but they're also, they're also not a real fighting force. And fragmented in this game is shown with a red stripe at the top of your banner. So if you see a red stripe, you're like, oh boy, these guys are one step from the fourth and final phase, which is when your flag turns all white. And that means the unit is routed. They're getting the heck out of there. They have lost, they know they've lost, they've panicked, and they have become routed. Now that is also how we score in this game. The more Roman troops um, that we route will actually show here under our score in green. And it will be as a percentage of their total number of units, it will show here in green as we route Roman troops, all right? Now, routed troops can be rallied. And how would they be rallied? Well, generals rally them. So if you can get a general into that unit, 
or uh, if a general is close, there are die rolls that happen. Uh, if a general's in the unit, it happens every single time. Uh, if not, then it's a little more sporadic that test whether those units rally and come back at least to fragmented and then eventually disrupted and then eventually ready status. Okay, so those are the four statuses that you have to think about. What are my troops in? And these banners will always show you that. Okay, great. So now uh, you know, we really have deployed. If we click on this and we look, I mean, you know, there's no place else we can really put these troops. We can't put them any further forward. Uh, one other thing that I maybe would show you is you can move units from one command to another. So you see this general, you know, he's commanding all the squares in brown. Uh, now we cannot do it with foot soldiers because he's a chariot guy. So let's go up here and let's see if there's anyone that we can move. Well, we can't do it with those guys because they are in chariots. The idea is, and I'll show you the icon here, and let's click on him again and hover over something over here. Oh, he can do the chariot. Okay, perfect, because it is within four. Okay, it, when you see this symbol right here, you can put this unit under his direct command, okay? And so they would be under his direct command at that point. You can change it over. And so that would be the final thing I would show you. That's really the deployment phase. Let's start the game. And how do you do that? Well, you click up here and you've now clicked in turn and the game always asks you to confirm it. And as we confirm it, the Romans move first and you see them start to move here. Now let's, we haven't really talked about tactics at all. It is now our turn. You can tell that because the golden leaf here starts to flash. What would be our tactics? What are you trying to do generally in a game like this? Well, what you wanna do is get your skirmishers, your light foot, out front, all right? We want to inflict as much damage with our missile launchers, our slingers, our javelin guys. If we had bowmen, we would want to get them out a little bit in the front. Now the bowmen have a greater range so they can hang back a little bit, but like javelin, javelin only has a range of one. Slingers, well, let's go look. How far of a range we can hit control and left click and it brings up our slingers and you can see it right here shooting sling range two so we need to get within two of the romans to start launching our slings okay so generally you want to get your light foot and your skirmishers out here in front and try to inflict some damage now cavalry and chariots of course you kind of want to get off to the edges here and you want to use them to take advantage of any offer opportunities as enemy uh, units start to fragment let's say or even route you can pursue them with your horse or with your chariots or we can get around to the side and we can flank attack things or even hopefully rear attack because nothing in this game is more powerful than attacking from the side or from the rear uh, you get all kinds of bonuses for doing that. Now that also reminds me, as we're talking about kind of overall strategy, that the higher ground generally always gives you advantages. And so those advantages start at 25, I think this is in meters, we'll call it meters, it doesn't really matter. You just see height 100, okay? And then what's the height down here? Well, it's zero because it doesn't show you anything. Now this is height 50, all right? So if you have a 100 height advantage over what you're fighting, you get bonuses for that. And if enemy troops try to charge you from a lower elevation, they get all kinds of penalties for that. So you never want to be charging up hills. You always generally want to be up on the hill or at the higher elevation. I mean, that's just a, that's kind of basic common sense. It goes with every war game you've ever played in your life. The higher ground in general is always the better ground, right? You would always rather be going down 
than trying to come up. Just a truism of warfare. Okay, then what do we do with our main troops here? Well, we that's a great question. I mean, one thing we want to do is make sure we don't get caught on the downside of this hill. Uh, we don't want to allow the Romans to get up here where we have to try to come up and attack them up a hill. We also have medium troops, and we can go and look at the Romans. What do the Romans have? Well, let's see. They have legionnaires, all right? Those are heavy foot. And if you look down in their uh, little uh, square down here that tells us all the information about them, it will tell you type heavy foot quality elite they are armored they are impact foot which means they are very good charging things because when you get into combat and we'll see this as we continue on there are two different sorts of combat with your infantry units the first round when they make first combat uh make first contact is called the impact round okay and that has different bonuses and different kinds of troops are better at it well the game is telling you right here capabilities impact foot swordsman impact foot means they're better in the impact round than they are just generally but generally they're excellent troops they're elite they're heavy foot they're well armored they're also swordsmen swords give you advantages in close combat and so these are awesome troops, but they do have a weakness and they are heavy foot. If we can get them in this rough terrain, they automatically get disordered. So we're going to try to lure them into, well, they only have, it looks like they only have one unit of this. Uh, the, well, I should say this is the only unit we can see right now. We're playing Fog of War. It's very likely they have more here. Now, what else do they have? They have uh, Scutari. Okay, these are medium foot. They are average. They do have some armor. They are also impact foot and swordsman, which makes them uh, very good. And, you know, when they first make contact and swordsman just makes them good in combat, that's a plus 100 of what is called points of advantage and everything in this game is decided by points of advantage now i told you this came from a board game uh, there are all sorts of tables that you will see but i can tell you you never need to go look at those the reason being is the tool tips when you were going to go into combat with uh, various uh, you know enemy units will tell you all of the factors now you may say, well, gosh, that doesn't do me a lot of good when I already make contact. You're going to have to play a few games. Now, I could sit here and read the whole table to you, um, but really, that's not going to do you any good. You're never going to remember that. If you, know, you want that, you can just go look at the manual, and it has a table in it. What gives you points of advantage? What subtracts or is penalties from points of advantage? What I'm going to do here is just kind of give you broad generalizations. And that would be that impact foot are going to be very good charging you when you make first contact. Okay. And swordsmen in general are very good at what is called close combat. Uh, and so, you know, these are very dangerous troops. They're very good. Meanwhile, the Scutari over here are medium foot. So they're much like our warriors here. Uh, they're average, they're protected, but they are good on the impact, okay? And so, you know, that first uh, coming together, they are very good at that. Let's look at our own troops now that we've seen the Romans. Our warriors, you know, they're medium foot. They're unmaneuverable, though, which means they do not get a free 45-degree turn. These guys just kind of go straight ahead. That's what they do, you know, so you're not going to be trying to like dance them around here and get around or do this and that. These guys are going straight forward. That's warriors. They are protected. They also are impact foot and they also are swordsmen. So we kind of counteract some of the advantages that the Romans normally have, which is they really hit you hard at impact and they've got those swords. OK, so, but our guys can kind of hang with that. So that's really what we see. I mean, they do have, let's look at these guys. Um, this is a sub-general. This is their cavalry. It's average and armored. Okay, this is just general cavalry here. And then they do have light horse archers. Okay, 
uh, so they can, you know, be shooting us off of horse, generally archery. Well, it's foot archers are, uh, let me look at exactly what their range are. I didn't look up the horse. Oh, mounted bow. So mounted bow has a range of two. Now, on foot archers has a what's called a short range of two where they deal 100% of their damage and a long range of four. So you will have some units that have a short range and a long range. The short range uh, in the case of a, of a foot bowman is two and they do 100% damage. The long range is four but in that case, they only do 50% damage if they're shooting as much as four hex away. Now, with mounted bow, we don't really have to worry about that. They do not have a long range. They only have that short range of two. And we'll have to keep that in mind. Our slingers now also have a range of two. We know that. So let's get to moving here. We're, we're playing the game now. And as you'll see, we have these blue this blue uh, marking in the hex. What does this mean? Well, we've selected this unit to move, okay? These slingers. And we wanna get these slingers moving forward here. We wanna make sure the Romans can't just go claim this hill. So we're gonna try to get them up here as fast as we can. Now, if we hit, you know, so we selected them. As we move out to hexes, you start to see what orders we can give for that unit to that hex. It shows us the maximum number of hexes we can move in every direction. So you can see how far you can go. Now it's important to remember, <clears throat> you may wanna save some action points to actually shoot, but that is not a concern at this moment. The Romans are too far away. But this blue that you see here would move all of the units in blue. It's just a time saver to allow you to move a bunch of units at the same time. We're not going to do that though because we don't want to move the horse uh, the same as we're moving these slingers. So we are going to move up here. We're going to left click to get the orders to come up and now we can either do move unit which would use 12 of our 12 action points you see there or we can move the whole command which is all of these guys but we do not want to do that so let's move our slingers and up they go running okay that's great and then we would just move on to the next unit now we have this cavalry together light javelin horse okay great i didn't notice this before these guys have javelins now javelins only generally and will control left click a range of one and also if you ever want to know what your units are going to do when they get into combat it will show you shooting they have javelins range one impact which is when they make first contact in a close combat they come into contact with an enemy unit light spear has a 50 point of advantage against anything okay it gives you a plus 50 great mounted troops in open terrain only has a plus 100 poa versus enemy light troops meaning foot bowman or mob so see it tells you everything and then melee is close combat after you've already locked horns and locked up with an enemy unit it says this unit has no melee cap capabilities in other words you don't want to get them caught in a melee fight you want them to go charge hit and then get the heck out of there okay and i'll show you all of that but i'm going to show you that next time uh, I'm trying to keep these to about 30 minutes. I think we've covered quite a bit. I will get that next video up early, as early as I can tomorrow, so that we are ready when uh, Field of Glory 2 Medieval hits. And then hopefully tomorrow night I'll have the game and uh, we can mess around with it a little bit. So that'll be a lot of fun. And I'll add that as a fifth episode where we look just at kind of the differences of Field of Glory 2 Medieval. So as always, Thank you so much, Strategy Gaming Dojo. I really appreciate uh, you stopping by. Hopefully you found this informative, and I'll talk to you next time.